It is now time for a question period. The member from Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. In the Privacy Commissioner's report released this morning, the truth about the culture of the Liberal Party of Ontario was finally revealed. Our suspicions have finally been confirmed. Government business is no longer the business of the people, and it hasn't been since that party has been in power. Crucial decisions about how public money will be spent are being made in secret, in the realm of private emails and Blackberries, only to be wiped from drives and computer memory, never to be seen again. Premier, this is your party's M.O. There is the public realm where the, we're told the government is operating. Then there's the secret world, the world hidden from the opposition, the media, and the public eye. The report is only the tip of the iceberg, Premier. People are breaking the law. Let the people pass judgment on your party's record, where billions are spent and no one is to blame. Will you call an election now and let the people finally pass judgment on your scandal plagued you. government? Here, here. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Premier. Very much, Mr. Speaker. And first of all, I want to uh, thank the member for the question, and I want to thank Dr. The member from Leeds Grenville will withdraw. Thank you, Premier. Dr. Kavukian for her report. We're uh, examining her uh, recommendations very closely, Mr. Speaker. But I want to be clear that from the moment that I have been in this office, Mr. Speaker, we have been following. We, well, <laughs> we've been following all of the rules in terms of retention of documents, Mr. Speaker. We have trained staff. We have made it clear what the expectations are, Mr. Speaker, and we have taken a number of steps to ensure that uh, additional steps to make sure that staff are aware of their responsibilities, Mr. Speaker. As I said, we've improved the uh, orientation for new employees, and we have put in place mandatory training so that everyone knows exactly what the rules are, Mr. Speaker. I would have it no other way, and we will continue in that vein, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. So badly did your government want to obfuscate the fact that they have been only acting in the interests of the Liberal Party that they have deleted countless emails. Now, apparently, Mr. Speaker, the files that existed on government computers have been transferred to USB memory sticks to avoid any scrutiny. The Privacy Commissioner found that your party's protocol was to transfer files off computers and, I quote, once this transfer is complete, original records should then be erased in such a way that they cannot be recreated. This protocol, Premier, is against the law. For months, the Liberals have been saying that they have acted in good faith, that they've been acting to protect the public interest. Sadly, a great deal of these records are irretrievably lost. Will you do what you can to salvage what little is left of your reputation Question. and immediately provide us with any and all remaining documents on secret drives and secret USB keys? So, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, let me be clear. The practice in my office and in the office of my caucus and my cabinet, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to go uh, right to the member's writings. The member from Renfrew come to order. The member from Prince Edward Hastings come to order. Finish, please. Our practice, Mr. Speaker, has been to follow the rules. We have done that from the moment that we came into office, Mr. Speaker. And I just want to read what the Privacy Commissioner said in her report. Throughout this entire investigation, my office received full cooperation of all parties involved, including the Premier's office, Cabinet office, and the MGS. Mr. Speaker, so we have been following the rules. We have made it very clear that the practices that will be in place, that have been in place since we came into this role, Mr. Speaker, have been Answer. in full compliance with the rules, and we will continue in that manner, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this falls directly on this Premier and this government. In the report released earlier today, the Commissioner speaks of, and I quote, an inappropriate deletion of emails by the former Premier's staff as part of the transition to the new Premier, saying, and I quote again from the Privacy Commissioner, it's difficult to escape that conclusion. 
You handpicked your staff, Premier. Your adults in McGuinty era two email account staff have made the decision to delete emails to avoid incrimination and to blur the line between government and liberal partisan interests to the point where it doesn't exist. The privacy commissioner Minister was Training clear. Colleges your government broke the law, and the private Gmail accounts we uncovered last week further prove the point. So I ask again, will you hand over the USB keys, full of the information you Mark tried Trump. to bury from Ontarians, or will, the only, or will this only end when the OPP break down the doors of the Premier's office and, uh, and coffers? Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, the tenor of the question notwithstanding, let me repeat that since February, Mr. Speaker, we have been committed to making changes to make sure that all staff in all of our offices are complying with the rules, Mr. Speaker. We have provided 130,000 documents to the Justice Committee, Mr. Speaker, 30,000 documents to the Justice Committee from my office, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to comply with the requests and we will continue to make sure that all of the rules are followed by my office Member and from Cambridge, government, you asked the Speaker. question, listen. Thank you. New question. Member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Speaker, my question is also for the Premier. Premier, Commissioner Kavukin has stated in a report that in early 2013, staff in the former Premier's office had approached the Secretary of Cabinet about how to permanently delete emails and other electronic documents, such as attached briefing notes. We also have found that members of your staff have been using private, non FOIable email accounts to communicate regarding government business. Premier, the buck stops with you. People in your former or in the premier, former Premier's office, people who have worked for you, people who work in this government, are breaking the law. It is not good enough to say it won't happen again. Who will be facing criminal charges and who will be resigning? Premier. Mr. Speaker, and I think I've, uh, I've addressed the issues around Dr. Kabukian's report, and we will be, we'll continue to work with the uh, Privacy Commissioner. And as I've said, we have taken extraordinary steps to make sure that all of our staff and that, uh, are, that, are that are following the rules. Mr. Speaker, in terms of the, uh, the email, let me be very clear. Matters not related to government business should not be, covered, should not be dealt with on, uh, on government computers, Mr. Speaker. Government business is obviously susceptible to and subject to Freedom of information, Mr. Speaker. What I have said in public is that where uh, private emails might be used are in examples like in a period of transition, there were many volunteers, Mr. Speaker, who were working on their private uh, private emails, new employees who might not have had a government account, certain transitory records, certain legislative deliberations, yes, Mr. Speaker, and instances of political partisan activity that should not be using government accounts. But, Mr. Speaker, all of those Thank rules you. will be followed. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, it's lovely to, for the Premier to quote the way it should work, but that's not the way it has worked with her government. People in the transition team from one Premier to another have broken the law. They use private emails to talk about government business. You've spoken so many hollow words about how you wanted to, this to be a transparent and open process, but your actions belie that, 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 uh, that promise. You have done everything you can to prevent us from getting to the bottom of this scandal. We know that your words are completely disingenuous. We will you now admit? It's not parliamentary. Withdraw, please. Withdraw. A ju judicial inquiry, Premier, is the only thing that will get to the bottom of your scandal. Will you now simply admit that your thirst to cling to power has corrupted you beyond repair? While I, uh, while I, uh, while I, uh, while I'm asking for attention, I'm not getting it. While I did not find that exactly unparliamentary, I'm going to ask all members, because of the heatedness of this particular nature, um, to uh, guard your words and race to the top. So I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, and, and I don't need 
and I don't need the editorials after the speaker makes a ruling. Premier, please answer. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, I just want to address the personal motivation that the uh, the member opposite seems to be uh, attacking. You know, my personal motivation for being in this place, Mr. Speaker, is to make sure that we deliver the services Order. that are necessary in the lives of people in, the, in this province. I'm only here, Mr. Speaker, because I believe in publicly funded education. I believe in public health care. I believe in making sure that government delivers the services that people need. Here, Mr. Speaker, and I'm in Member the leadership from Durham, because not I, sit down. I believe that we have a lot of work to do in terms of continuing to deliver those services, Mr. Speaker, and, and sir, continue to strengthen them. So, Member from Nepean Carlton will come to order. I appreciate the, the, Dr. Kavuki's Member, report. Sure the we are working to, to make sure that every law is followed. Since February, we have taken Thank measures you. to make sure that those are in place, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. That's a lovely story, Premier, but you're the boss and the buck stops no, with you. Sure. You are responsible. 13 million Ontarians deserve better than this. The Commissioner has made it very clear you broke the law. Staff were taught how to break the law and then went on to break the law. And all because your government is addicted to power. The stain of the scandal is on you and every member of your government. I actually uh, stood to ask the government to come to order, and now I end up having to ask you to come to order. I, uh, I I'll wait. Premier. I'm You're always in the team. The team has got me excited. The member, finish your question, please. As I said, the stain is on you and every member of your government. The people of Ontario no longer have confidence in you. Even the third party must be reconsidering their decision to prop you up. Will you simply admit that you are no longer fit to government in this province as you have lied to the people of Ontario? Yeah. I know the member's ready. Withdraw, please. Withdraw. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Privacy Commissioner, Dr. Kavukian, has, has given us some recommendations on practices that need to be changed, Mr. Speaker. When we came into office, when I took on this role, Mr. Speaker, we put in place rules, we made it clear, we put training in place to make it clear what the rules were and make sure that all staff followed those rules, Mr. Speaker. We will continue in that manner. I have done everything in my power since I came into this role to make sure that information that was asked for was provided, to open up a process to make sure that the questions could be asked and information could be received. We will continue in that manner, Mr. Speaker. Speaker. And yes, as I said, we are working with the Privacy Commissioner's Office. She has appreciated how we have worked with her. We will continue to do that as we look at the recommendations, and I appreciate that she has made Thank the recommendations, you. Mr. Speaker. Your question, Speaker of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier, and I think it's a pretty obvious one. Does the Premier agree that it was wrong and likely illegal for senior Liberal polit political staff to actually destroy information about the gas plants? Premier. So, Mr. Speaker, I've been very clear what the practice is in my office, and I have been clear from the day that we came into office that all of the rules will be followed. And the As I turned my head to look for a stop clock, please, I heard somebody say something unparliamentary, and I would offer the member an opportunity to withdraw it, whoever that was, and if not, I'll be watching. Premier. So, Mr. Speaker, my...
So, Mr. Speaker, I've been. I find it regrettable that uh, some people have taken the moment to uh, say things that they're not, uh, by convention, supposed to say, and some people continue to talk while I'm trying to get attention. Okay. Uh, wrap up, please. Very much, Mr. Speaker. So, since February, we took steps to make sure that all political staff were aware of their responsibilities, of what the rules were, and that that's why we put training in place. That's why we've changed the practices in the office. Mr. Thank you. Supplementary. Information and Privacy Commissioner said that destroying information quote undermined key legislation as well as transparency and accountability. Will the Premier tell Ontarians what the government was trying to hide when senior Liberal political staff were destroying information? Speaker? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And as I have said a number of times, we have provided all of the documents, Mr. Speaker, that we have been asked for. My office has provided 30,000 documents, 130,000 documents across government. So, Mr. Speaker, we are working to make sure that all of the information that's being asked for is provided. We are following the rules in the office. We have put training in place, Mr. Speaker, and we will work with the Privacy Commissioner as she has put forward some recommendations that we want to work on with her. Thank you very much. Much, Thank you. So, final supplementary. Speaker, Ontario's Information and Privacy Commissioner said she has, quote, trouble accepting that deleting emails was simply part of a benign attempt to efficiently manage one's email accounts. She's raising serious questions, Speaker. Does the Premier really believe that when the Minister of Energy's Chief of Staff, the former Premier's Chief of Staff, his Principal Secretary, and his Energy Advisor were destroying all of these documents that they were simply Don't trying to keep their happen. inboxes clean, Speaker? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As I said, Dr. Dr. Kabukin has raised some serious concerns. She's put recommendations forward. We have taken proactive steps since we've been here in February to make sure that all of the rules are being followed and information is available and is retained, and all of those, all of those protocols are in place, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to work with the uh, Privacy Commissioner because I think the recommendations that she has put forward are very important, and they come out of legitimate concerns that she has raised. So we will continue to work with her. Thank you. For new questions? Question is uh, for the, the Premier. Court. Thank you. When the Premier took control of the Liberal Party in January, the cancelled private power deals and the impending hearings were one of the key f challenges that were facing her party. And at the heart of that issue was whether documents were being hidden. Did the Premier ask any questions, Speaker, or raise any concerns at all? Excuse me. Seated, please. I'll hold the question. Stop the clock, please. The member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound will withdraw. Thank you. Uh, you put your question. You finished. Any questions or raise any concerns at all about emails being deleted in the Premier's office? Mr. Mr. Speaker, let me remind. Let me remind the leader of the third party of what happened in terms of the gas plant situation when the new premier took over. <coughs> the member from Newmarket Aurora come to order, the member from Halton come to order, and the member from Durham come to order. Mr. Speaker, it was this Premier that offered a special committee to the opposition, which they rejected. So then, when they, they decided to go after a former member of the House, she worked to have the committee's mandate broadened. It was this Premier, Mr. Speaker, who wrote to the Auditor General and asked him to look into the Oakville situation. It was this Premier who asked Liberal members of the committee to ask for a government wide search for documents, which the opposition rejected. It's been under this Premier's watch that we have seen 130. 30,000 documents go to the committee. Thank you. Supplementary. 
asking questions about missing emails long before this Premier took control of the Liberal Party. There were serious questions about senior Liberal staff deleting emails and destroying information. And the Liberal leader knew or should have known what was happening when she took over. When the Premier was sworn in, did she ask any questions at all about why this information had been destroyed, or was it simply a case of don't ask, don't tell? Mr. Speaker, there have been 130,000 documents that have been provided to the committee, including 30,000 from the Premier's office. In terms of the practices that are cited by the IPC in her report, the Premier has addressed that. She has talked about the measures this government has taken to make sure that we have tighter controls. She has also outlined, and Mr. Speaker, I can inform the House that in my capacity as Minister of Government Services, I have asked this morning for a meeting with the IPC so that I can sit down with her and we can work together to make sure that we can strengthen our safeguards to make Make sure Answer. that this situation does not happen again and that rules and regulations are followed. Thank you. Final supplementary. The Commissioner reports that, quote, it is difficult to escape the conclusion that records were destroyed during the transition phase. Yet, as new leader of the Liberal Party, the Premier didn't ask any questions or raise any issues. Why didn't the Premier ask the basic questions that anyone who is genuinely concerned about missing documents would have asked? Mr. Mr. Speaker, we have a committee of the legislature which has is, is been constituted to be called at the call of the chair, meaning that it is up to the members themselves, of which they have a majority of when it can meet. They can summon any witnesses they want. My understanding is they have had 33-plus witnesses have come forward, including the present Premier, Minister of Energy, former Ministers of Energy. They have also been provided with 130,000 documents, including 30,000 from the Premier's office. Mr. Speaker, the current Premier has gone to great lengths to be as open and transparent as possible on this issue. And again, Mr. Speaker, we have charged the committee of this legislature, which is completely unfettered, and Answer. allowed them to look into any aspect of this situation. Thank you. New question, the member from Thornhill. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Minister, I've been surprised with your reaction to the release of a list of proposals on how to further pick the pockets of Ontarians to raise the money you need to balance your budget. Here you are, a former bank executive, facing me, a former corporate executive. We've had to ask our subordinates to cut costs. They'd complain, but they'd do it. 10% really difficult, 5% tough but not impossible, 2 or 3% was a walk in the park. So here we are talking about moving towards balance. And make no mistake, Minister, talking about it is mostly what you people do. And we discover that you have a nickel and dime list aimed at grabbing more and pulling it out of the economy. We have offered to assist with the select committee, but you're dismissive of wanting to find savings. If you had a list of new revenue tools, there should be a companion list asking ministries where they could cut costs, Question. like we both had to do in our private sector lives. Is there such a memorandum, Minister? Thank you, Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for the question. It gives me the opportunity to reaffirm uh, the outstanding work that we are doing in controlling our spending, being disciplined and determined. That's why our, our spending growth is less than 1 per cent year over year. It's why we've exceeded our targets for the four years running by $21 billion. Last year alone, it was a $5 billion reduction in, in, our, uh, in our deficit. We'll continue to do that, Mr. Speaker. And of course, we've reviewed and we've assessed all of the fees that are applicable to government, and we've rejected many of them that the member opposite makes reference to. We will continue to do our job. We look forward to the members opposite to support our budget as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you. I'm beginning to get the idea that we in Ontario have seen Tweedledum and Tweedledee replaced by Frick and Frack. I, I'm beginning to think. I'm beginning to think you haven't got any bright ideas on how to move this province toward balance. Maybe no ideas at all, except grabbing all you can or settling with unions like Opsu, only to have their leader laugh at you. And I'm beginning to think you better fess up. You may not like my party's plan, but we're the only party in this House that has advanced any plan at all. The third party wants whatever it wants, and you just give it to them. How is that constructive? And you wonder why we are not willing participants in your budget process. The answer is because we don't want to be your accomplices. Minister, Ontarians want to know 
how much more you're going to make them pay for your government Answer spending habit. Question. Because of you, Ontario is now the seventh highest borrower in the world that isn't actually a country. Are you or aren't you capable of balancing the budget by reducing costs? If not, will you thank you? Minister of Finance. Stop the clock, please. You stand in place. You stand in place. Before I uh, start the clock, I'm uh, I'm getting a little anxious with some of the armchair quarterbacks who all continually ask me to do somebody else's job. I will do my job. And what's frustrating is that uh, for those individuals who ch try to watch the clock for me and tell me how to do that, my record is about two seconds off in question period, and I check every day. So for those that uh, claim that uh, people are getting way too much time, knock it off. And for those that have decided that uh, they know how to do it better here, knock it off. <laughs> Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, the, the member opposite just referenced his plan. His plan doesn't add up. It's, it's fraught with mistakes. Even the mathematics of his plans are incorrect. And we've stated that and we've showed it to them. And now they have the audacity to suggest that they have a better plan. Well, I can, I, can, I can assure the member opposite that during my discussions and deliberations with bondholders and rating agencies, they are very satisfied with what it is that we are doing. Ontario is being well received because of the strong economic fundamentals that we have, because of the plan that we have to balance, and the methodic way in which we're doing it. And the member opposite should know. Ontario is the only province that has not only yes, met those targets on an ongoing basis, we've exceeded them when the others have not. And we'll continue on this path of being disciplined in our spending, Thank and you. we're going to do everything possible Thank to you. increase our. New question, the member from Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. To the Premier. Long before the Premier was sworn in as Liberal leader, I raised serious questions about emails here, here. that seemed to be missing from the Premier's office. When the Premier became Liberal leader, did she raise any questions about what was missing and why? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So I want to address this question, and, uh, and it speaks to the issue that was raised by the leader as well. I have said repeatedly, Mr. Speaker, that as soon as I came into this office, we put in place protocols. I, I made sure that staff understood what the rules were, Mr. Speaker. I did ask questions about what protocols were being followed, Mr. Speaker, which is why there's extra training that has been done. When new staff come in, they know what the rules are, Mr. Speaker. We are following the rules. We have turned over information, 30,000 documents from our office, Mr. Speaker, and that has been all part of our commitment my commitment, my personal commitment to open up the process to make sure that all of the information that was being asked for was received by the people who were asking for Thank it. Thank you. Supplementary. Premier, you still haven't answered that question. You've talked about what your office has done, but when you came to office, you didn't investigate the destruction of emails, the absence of of information, the inability to respond to a freedom of information request. Documents were destroyed and you didn't seem to care. Why didn't you ask the basic questions that anyone concerned about the facts would have asked? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I asked the questions about what our practice was going to be and how we were going to conduct our office, Mr. Speaker, and how we were going to open up the process. The government house leader has outlined what we did, Mr. Speaker, in terms of, a, of asking that there be a select committee put in place, which was rejected by the opposition, opening up the mandate of the Justice Committee, making sure that there was a forum for all of the questions to be asked and answered, Mr. Speaker. We have worked with the Privacy Commissioner. We will continue to work with her. We have asked the Auditor General to look at both situations. He has and is doing that, Mr. Speaker. We are doing everything in our power to comply with the rules, to make sure that information is provided, and to make sure that there's an, an open and transparent process going forward, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. Member from Ottawa, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question through you is for the Minister of Energy. Minister, Ontario is a leader in clean energy. Thanks to our government's investment, we've created 31,000 jobs Order. and a resilient renewable energy sector across the province. I know we've also been listening to municipalities to hear their ideas 
to prove how we cite renewable energy projects and how we can better engage local communities from the beginning. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Energy, could the Minister please update the House on the steps our government is taking to improve the siting and procurement of renewable energy projects across Ontario? Minister of Energy, question, Mr. Speaker. Our government is solidly committed to investing in renewable energy. It creates good jobs, eliminates dirty coal fire generation, and cleans up our air. And we have listened to communities and mayors. For large renewable projects, the Ontario Power Authority is creating a new bidding process where priority approval is given to projects that have prior municipal approval, making it extremely difficult for contracts to be awarded without an arrangement with the municipality. The new rules also empower and give to municipalities and other public entities uh, extra power to engage as owners and partners in projects moving forward. We are providing funding to small and medium-sized municipalities to yes, create sir. municipal energy plans. And we're increasing property taxes on wind turbines to provide revenue Thank to you. municipalities. Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister of Energy for that update. I know my constituents will be pleased to hear our government remains committed to investing in clean, renewable energy. Our investments have helped build enough clean energy to power 900,000 homes. As we move forward, these changes will help strengthen our green energy economy by bringing stability and predictability to the system, providing communities with increased local control over the planning and siting of renewable energy projects is a responsible thing to do. It will not only ensure communities have a voice, but will make sure all areas benefit from continued development. Speaker, I know that there have been specific concerns in many of Ontario's rural areas regarding renewable energy. Could the minister please update this House on what our government is doing to address the concerns of Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Uh, minister of Rural Affairs, Speaker. Minister of Rural Affairs, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member, member for from Prince Edward Hastings. Come question. to order. Our government has proposed new rules for setting renewable energy projects that respect rural communities and give them a stronger voice. Member from here on we Bruce, instruct come the right to order. to provide what residents member deserve, from what municipalities want, and what the industry needs to grow to create jobs. But don't take my word for it. Here's some of our five rural, bear, rural bears and what they're saying. Quote: It's good news for municipalities. Kingsville Mayor Nelson Santos. Absolutely, it's a step forward. Leaving to Mayor John Patterson. I will continue to work with rural communities across Ontario and my colleagues here at Queen's Park to identify opportunities to further strengthen rural Ontario. Because, Mr. Speaker, when rural yes, Ontario succeeds, all Ontario is stronger, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Question? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. Minister, Ontario already has the highest processing fees in all of Canada for employers who want to hire skilled immigrants through the Provincial Nominee Program. Yet, according to your Treasury Board document, you want to increase these fees by yet another $500. Minister, will you ensure that Ontario businesses, many of which are already facing significant obstacles to growth, will not be faced with another $500 fee hike? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for the question. Um, as the member knows, uh, immigration is a shared responsibility between the provincial government and the federal government. And the Temporary Foreign Worker Agreement is, a, uh, is an agreement between the federal government, provincial government. To date, Mr. Speaker, we've only had, we've only had 30 people last year who have gone through the Temporary Foreign Worker application process here in our province through our, our government. And um, we have this mechanism there to allow for organizations that uh, work with agriculture, that uh, work to fill specific needs, to fill in those gaps that are necessary to make sure that Ontario is successful. This is a proposal that has uh, that is temporary, uh, that is currently in the process, and it hasn't uh, been approved, and it's something we're exploring. But we need to make sure that, at the end of the day, that Ontario is set up for success and temporary Answer. foreign workers through the PNP program is a mechanism we'll use. Well, 
as the minister will know, the fees associated with the PNP program are entirely provincial. And let's go over some of the fees applicable in other jurisdictions. Currently, in order to process a skilled worker in BC, they charge $550, New Brunswick $250. Newfoundland $150, Prince Edward Island $150. Alberta, who's also facing skilled labour charges, but through the PNP have seen their immigration rates doubled, does not charge a fee for this service. But what does Ontario do, Mr. Speaker? Charges $2,000 already. Minister, how can you possibly expect Ontario's businesses to compete for, with the rest of Canada when your government's current processing fee is about four times higher than its nearest competitor? What are you going to do? Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, we want to make sure that Ontario is set up, set up for success. If we compare our PNP programs, if we compare our provincial nominee programs to other provinces. Member from Halton, come to order. Thank you. Answer, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If we compare our PMP program in Ontario to other provinces, we know that Alberta and Manitoba have 5,000 each. In Ontario, we're at 1,300. We need to make sure that we get to that 5,000 mark so we can attract the best and brightest people here to our province so we can continue to be successful. This is a proposal that we're moving forward, that we, uh, that we want to move forward on. It's something that we believe is, uh, is, is right for the province. And Mr. Speaker, I just want to remind the member opposite that this is a cost recovery program. 98% of the, the actual cost of this proposal Answer. is cost recovery. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. To the Minister of Infrastructure. Last week, I asked the Minister of Infrastructure about his department's decision to more than double the rent paid by the Mary Berkeley Community Health Centre in Ignace. In response, he stated that they were paying $5 a square foot for basic rent. He neglected to point out that his figure fails to include the compulsory O&M fees, realty tax and management fees, and all of the repair costs, which brings their triple net lease to $228,022.63 and translates to $23.77 per square foot. But the minister should know this because he has access to the same information. My question is simple. Is the minister prepared to make this situation right instead of continuing to deny the facts? Mr. Chair, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I don't, I don't think we disagree. Uh, the base rent is five dollars. It was three fifty. Every other health centre, the ones in my constituency, pay base rents much higher than five dollars, twelve, twenty, twenty-five dollars plus. Have to pay on top of that. I have said many times to the member uh, that we are trying to work with them, and there has been a significant communication between my office and Mary Berglund to try and sort through how we can do that. Um, Obviously, $3.50, which was the base rent, uh, is before it was raised, it was raised to $5 as a relatively modest rent. I appreciate the challenges that the health centre is, is, is facing. We are working with the Ministry of Health right now, who have correspondingly increased their grants to do that, to try and figure out a way uh, in which either by looking at the amount of space or the Answer. storage space to find a solution to it, um, but they are not paying or ordinarily higher rents compared to other health Thank centers. You. Thank you. Elementary. Berglund CHC has been trying to resolve this issue for three years. Whenever the issue is raised in question period or through letters to ministry officials, the response from the government is never grounded in accurate information or correct figures. This rent is so unaffordable that already they've been forced to lay off staff and the executive director sure. has voluntarily given herself a pay cut to help pay the bills. Sure. Wow. The executive director is so desperate to resolve the situation and protect the viability of her CHC that she has traveled to Queen's Park today and she's sitting with a board member in the gallery. The ministers of infrastructure and health and long-term care meet with the executive director today, after question period, to finally resolve this issue. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the short answer is yes, of course. Uh, and I had committed to the member from Kenora Rainy River that as soon as this house rises, I would come to her constituency to meet with if it wasn't solved by that time, and I will maintain that commitment. If we cannot uh, resolve it before the House rises, uh, I, will, uh, I will come up and view the situation personally. The, 
I would also be interested in the details of the funding formula because the Lynn funds increases to health centres. Uh, and, and if there is a gap there or there's information that we may be missing, uh, I would be quite happy to be so informed. The challenge is, and this is a challenge across, across government, Mr. Speaker, I want to say this so all members understand. We were charging historically over the yes, last sir. many decades different rents, so there were hidden subsidies. The idea now is to get to a full cost recovery, members, so that everything is fair and transparent. Thank you. If in that process there's been problems, we'll correct Thank you. Thank you. Your question, the member from Scarborough Legion Court. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Environment. This week is Canadian Environmental Week, which is an opportunity to people across Canada to celebrate our natural environment. The theme this year is Water Working Together, and is fitting tribute to 2013 being designated as the International Year of Water Cooperation. Considering our province borders to on four Great Lakes and is home to more than a quarter of a million lakes, rivers and streams, working together to restore the, and protect our water is critical to maintain our natural wealth. Speaker, through you to the minister, can you please tell the House how the government is helping people in their communities working together to protect their local water sources? Mr. The environment. Question, I'm pleased to acknowledge in the gallery of former Environment Minister Norm Sterling for with us today. This year's theme for Canadian Environment Week provides an excellent opportunity for people to reflect on the excellent work we've achieved together protecting such a valuable resource called water. Our government is helping people come together through their communities and local organizations to play a role in protecting their local source of water. Our Great Lakes Guardian Community Fund supports local cooperative activities that aim to restore and safeguard areas across the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River Basin. The Lake Partner Program is a volunteer-based water quality monitoring program which helps us monitor more than 600 inland lakes wow and the showcasing water innovation program fosters innovation by funding partners across the province who are finding innovative and cost-effective answer solutions for managing drinking water systems wastewater and stormwater systems this is thank people you. working together for the environment thank you supplementary thank you speaker i'd like to thank the minister for providing the house with details about the various great programs and invaluable volunteer efforts people undertaking across the province cooperating and working together to protect our water i'm also pleased to see our government taking continued action to foster community cooperation and facilitate the type of collaboration that is required to restore our fresh water back to environmental health speaker to you to the minister, can he please elaborate on future initiatives our government will be undertaking to support local efforts to protect Ontario's fresh water sources? Thank you, Minister. Yes, again, I, I like to thank the member for the question. The 2013 Ontario budget is building upon the successful leadership role that communities have taken in protecting local drinking water sources across Ontario. The budget, if passed, will provide $13.5 million to protect the quality and quantity of drinking water sources for the people of Ontario working in partnership with small and rural municipalities. We have to remember where this all started, Walkerton. We can draw a straight line from the Walkerton tragedy to Justice O'Connor's recommendation to the work of the source protection committees. Our government has already invested $200 million in the local development of the that source water protection plans. And we Answer. look forward with anticipation Million. to continuing to support our small and rural municipalities with the support of my opposition Thank colleagues you. in passing the budget. Thank you. New question, the member from Nepean Carlton. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is to the Premier. All throughout this gas plant scandal, you have maintained that this is a problem. You, you're going to want to hear this. That you've maintained that this is all Dalton McGuinty's fault. Your House leader today issued a statement saying since February you have put new rules in place. Speaker, our party has emails from Nick Smith, the Premier's head of transition and a senior advisor in the, in the Premier's office and a former MPP of this Assembly. In this email, she's discussing government business about privileged gas plant documents and questioning the Speaker's ruling into the contempt of Parliament. I'll provide those to you, Speaker. Uh, do you know the date of those emails, Speaker? From, Mar from Monique Smith on March 6, 2013. 
Speaker, the Premier's most senior trans trans transition adviser is now clearly implicated in the gas plant scandal. Will you fire Manick Smith today, and will you call the OPP in to investigate? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, the member opposite has that email, Mr. Speaker. The ember, member opposite has that information. As I have said, Mr. Speaker, we have done everything in our power to answer the questions, provide the information that has been asked for. There are instances, Mr. Speaker, when private email needs to be used in partisan situations, in uh, situations where it's non-government. There are instances in transition, Mr. Speaker, where private email was used by volunteers, by people who are part of the transition. We are working, Mr. Speaker, very hard to make sure that all the information is provided. Witness the fact that the member opposite has the information that she was asked Thank looking you. for, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. There lies the problem, Speaker. Yesterday, her Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs said that the Liberal campaign team and the government were the same thing. That's, right. That's a type of arrogance and hypocrisy that is astounding to the people who I represent. Now, I have another email, Speaker, and it is from the Premier herself, this one on February 10, 2013. It's from Manix Biss, who is using her Premier's office email account, which meant if she had one on February 10, 2013, she certainly had one on March 6, when she was conducting her government business on her Gmail account. What's curious about Manix Smith's February 10, 2013 email is that this one is sent to Kathleen Owen at gmail.com. Premier, that's your email. It's your personal email Question. used in this gas plant cover-up. Can you tell Order. me what other government business you're doing on your private you. Gmail account in order to skirt from Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As I have said, the member opposite has that information. The member opposite has the email and has the contents of the email, Mr. Speaker. What I, what I will do and have done, Mr. Speaker, is make sure that when there are questions where there is relevant information, that we provide that information, we provide the answers, which is why the member opposite has the email in question, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for your question. The third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Families with loved ones in long-term care homes expect these homes to be safe, Speaker. Yep. Yesterday, the minister said that all of these homes receive annual inspections, but she neglected to mention that these are related to complaints and critical incidents. In communities like Windsor, 90 per cent of long-term care homes have never received a full inspection as required by this government's own rule, Speaker. Will the minister commit to providing the full resident quality inspections for every home so that families Families don't have to wait for a tragic incident to occur before seeing an inspector in their long-term care home. Thank you. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, uh, thank you, Speaker. And, um, yes, let me be very clear. There are uh, three different kinds of inspections. There are the critical incident uh, and complaint-related inspections. And uh, Last year, there were 2,347 of those inspections, Speaker. There are also the, uh, the RQI, the more thorough, intensive inspections, Speaker, and there, in, in addition, there are inspections that are done in homes where there are no, have been no complaints received in that year, Speaker. So there is an inspector in every home in every year. I look forward to the supplementary because I think we've been over these numbers a few times. I do want to talk about some of the other excellent work that is happening in long-term care homes to uh, improve the quality of care. Yeah. Thank you, supplementary. Speaker, families have placed their trust in this government to do their job and make sure that long-term care homes for seniors are inspected annually. When 90 per cent of long-term care homes in Windsor-Essex have never had a full inspection, it's clear this government is failing at its job to protect seniors. Speaker, the government has already missed their first deadline of December 31, 2011. Will the minister provide a new timeline of when every long-term care home in Windsor and in Ontario will actually receive 
a proactive, thorough inspection. Uh, speaker, as I have said, uh, uh, I have asked ministry officials to come forward with some options on how to strengthen inspections in long-term care homes. But let's talk about some of the other things that are happening. I am particularly proud of Behavioural Supports Ontario, and you've heard uh, me talk about that, but I thought it might be interesting to hear specifically. There's now a mobile outreach team in the Waterloo, Wellington, Lynn. They're following 818 residents in long-term care homes who have behavioral challenges. Speaker, Since they have become active, they've seen an 81 per cent reduction in observed behaviors um, recorded uh, for those particular patients, an 81 per cent reduction. Speaker, in addition, there's been a 63 per cent reduction in transfers to hospital for people Order. with mental health challenges. Speaker, this is a remarkable success that is coming from specific investments yes, to provide better care for people with behavioural challenges, most often dementia. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Ajax Pickering. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. My riding of Ajax Pickering is home to many constituents who take time out of their busy schedules to volunteer their knowledge, time and service for the betterment of our community. Mr. Speaker, Ontario can even boost a slightly higher volunteer rate than Canada as a whole. At an individual level, volunteer engagement enriches, empowers and builds a sense of belonging to my community. At the community level, volunteer engagement promotes Inclusion and unity. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, how is the Minister of Citizenship and Immigration recognizing these tremendous individuals and organizations? Thank, thank you. you. Minister, uh, Minister, uh, Minister, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for his question. Each year, Ontario benefits from the work of more than six million volunteers. These volunteers uh, collectively contribute more than 860 million hours annually. And our province has a long and proud tradition of volunteerism. This spring, I was privileged to attend the June Callwood Outstanding Achievement Awards for Volunteerism. Throughout her life, the late Ms. Callwood was a tireless champion for the most vulnerable people in our society. She was a fearless activist, advocate and writer whose me immeasurable accomplishments strengthened the social fabric of the commu every community that she touched. Through her passion to serve the most disadvantaged people in our province, she helped convince others to take care of one another. As such, she's forged a long-lasting legacy here in Ontario. Named in her honour, this award recognizes individuals who donate their knowledge, their energy, their spirit, and most importantly, their time to make their communities a better place to live. Right. Mr. Speaker, these volunteers remind me of what it means to be a great citizen here in our Thank great you. province. Yeah. Yeah. I was honoured to present this award. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister. It's great to hear one of the examples of our government recognizing Ontario's outstanding volunteers. While it is important to celebrate the hard work of these volunteers, it is also important to engage the not-for-profit sector where many of our volunteers leave their mark. Not-for-profit organizations deliver many vital government services, promote social inclusion, and help build economically and socially vibrant communities, including my community of Ajax Pickering. Excluding hospitals, universities and colleges, the impact of not-for-profit sector on the economy is close to $29 billion in combined revenue annually. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, what is our government doing to support not-for-profit sector? Thank you. Question. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for bringing to light the importance of Ontario's not-for-profit sector. As the minister responsible for this sector, I'm proud of, over, of the 46,000 organizations serving every region and demographic in our province. The not-for-profit sector creates jobs and helps attract new investments to Ontario communities by providing strong recreational, cultural and social infrastructure. The government and the not-for-profit sector share similar goals. Mr. Speaker, that's why we launched the partnership project two years ago to better understand what we could do to support the not-for-profit organizations and strengthen our relationship with that sector. To this end, we've developed a number of initiatives. For example, Mr. Speaker, through our partnership grant program, we're investing $7.3 million wow. over three years wow. to help 27 organizations find ways to operate more efficiently, extend their reach, and promote sir. volunteerism. This government will continue to recognize the valuable contributions of thousands of organizations that make up the Ontario not-for-profit yeah, sector yeah, and will yeah, strengthen yeah. our relationship. 
Here, here. Speaker, your question, the from Kitchener, Thank you, Speaker. And my uh, question is to the Premier. Premier, in April, you joined a long list of senior Liberals who've gone out on a limb to defend the eco-tax scheme cooked up by your government five years ago. Despite the PC party's repeated calls for these needless taxes to be scrapped, you told Ontarians that eco-taxes were, quote, just the cost of dealing with waste. Premier, your position is unacceptable. Consumers shouldn't be built $200 million a year to fund Liberal recycling cartels. Now that you're forcing the Environment Minister to table a recycling bill tomorrow to make up for five years of Liberal failure on the environment, can you assure Ontarians that your government will meet the PC party's demand to scrap eco taxes, which were created by the godfather of this tax scheme, <coughs> Dalton McGuinty. Mr. Premier, Minister of the Environment. Well, one almost doesn't know how to answer that particular question, other than to say if there were a paternity suit that would be launched on this issue, it would go to the Progressive Conservative Party that brought in the bill in the year 2002 which has caused so much problems, which allowed the establishment of what uh, we would describe as cartels. I uh, cannot believe that you can be asking a question of this kind when the real godfather of eco-fees is your leader, the member for Niagara West Glanbrook, right. who, when he was Minister of Consumer and Commercial Relations, as I think it was called then, and criticized, by the way, by the former member for Owen Sound That's right. very severely, uh, did nothing about eco fees or the possibility of preventing them. Our government yes, is a government that's going to tackle this issue and uh, ensure that it is simply a cost of doing business and not an additional Thank fee. You. Speaker, it's quite humorous to hear the Environment Minister blame a 10 year old piece of legislation when Ontario's current problems all stem from the decisions made by your government. We all know Liberal regulations cooked up by Ontario's godfather of eco-taxes, the former Premier, forces consumers to pick up the tab for recycling tires, electronics, paint cans and batteries, after being surprised by these additional charges at the cash register. It is this system that's created the mess that we're in today. So, Premier, when the Environment Minister tables his recycling bill tomorrow, can we expect to see a commitment to undo five years of Liberal damage that has cost Ontario consumers hundreds of millions of dollars and left the province's recycling rate parked at just 23 per cent. Minister of the Environment. Uh, I have consulted widely with a number of groups and organizations and individuals on legislation that could be brought forward in the House at a future date, uh, bringing forward a new bill to replace the bill the flawed bill that was passed by the Conservative government when it was in majority. And almost to a person, they have indicated the real problem that exists is the original bill. And all of the problems that have arisen from that, they have made recommendations to me. I happen to believe, for instance, the Ontario Waste Management Association and others have some great ideas that I want to see incorporated in any legislation that might be introduced in this House. And the last thing I want to do is wonder if the former Minister of the Environment's scars on his back have healed. Answer. Yeah. Good question. The member from Nickelbelt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Back Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. From Baxter, the company that makes intravenous cancer drugs for Ontario Hospital for 27 years prior to Marchese being awarded the contract that led to the diluted chemo drug tragedy. Baxter told us that they, it would have been impossible for them to prepare those chemotherapy drugs at the Marchese's bidding price. My question is simple. Is the minister certain that the lower price wasn't the main deciding factor for MedBuy when they awarded the contract to Marchese? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Speaker, and, um, and I'm very pleased to see that the committee is doing a, a very thorough job when it comes to investigating this situation. 
Uh, I think it's important, Speaker, that uh, we let Dr. Jake Thiessen, who is doing a review of the cancer drug safety uh, um, uh, system in Ontario, that we let him do his work. He will be coming forward with recommendations. Yeah. We have moved forward on uh, uh, some initial um, uh, initiatives to, to uh, improve oversight, Speaker, but I do think it's very important that we let Jake Thiessen do his report, that we let the committee do their work, and that we re review uh, uh, the entire knowledge that is gained through this process. Here, here. Here's supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the committee is doing their work, and it is becoming more and more obvious that what the committee has been told about price being a minor factor in the decision-making is actually not the case. After weeks of hearing, it is clear that the contract was awarded without any certainty of process, communication, or clarity, for that matter. What we do know is that MedBuy needs to find savings to justify its existence. That's why they exist. Marchese's price was less, and this seems to have carried the most weight in the decision that was made. Will the minister admit that her system of outsourcing and privatization is in desperate need of stronger guidelines and protection? Question. And is she prepared to take this responsibility seriously and provide comprehensive oversight of that sector? Thank you. Mr. Uh, well, Speaker, unfortunately, the member opposite has, uh, has already determined the outcome of, uh, of this work, and that is unfortunate because others have testified, Speaker. Uh, let me quote Sandy Jensen, who is the Director of Pharmacy Services at London Health Sciences Centre. She said, outsourcing these two agents was not in any way an effort to save money. It was absolutely around efficiency, around safety. That is one quote. Christine Donaldson, Director of Pharmacy at Windsor Regional Hospital, testified, in that case, really, cost didn't come into it as a factor. It was more safety and risk that had actually motivated us to choose this product from Marchese or from any other outside buyer. Speaker, we have heard various testimony at the at committee. I think it's important that uh, people understand Answer. that this is being taken very seriously. We have acted, and we will continue to act if so recommended. Thank you. Your question, the member from Thunder Bay, Atacokan. Thank you, Speaker. Yes, Speaker, my uh, my question is for the Minister of Community and Social Services. Minister, in uh, in my riding of Thunder Bay, Atacokan, both my constituency offices, actually the one in Thunder Bay and the one in Atacokan proved to me to be the best vehicle through which I get information relative to the concerns of, of the people in my uh, communities and the constituents that I represent. I'd say it's probably the case for most of the members here. One of the, one of the issues that I have consistently heard about from my constituents in Thunder Bay, Atacokan, is in regard to the supports and the programming, the services, the financial investments that we made when it comes to people with developmental disabilities and their families. And Minister, I'm just wondering if you can uh, recount for the legislature what we've done since being elected in 2003. Thank you. Minister of Community and Social Services. Mr. Speaker, and uh, I appreciate the member's question. And given it's clearly coming from a place of caring, uh, I will respond as best I can. Our government, uh, Mr. Speaker, remains uh, strongly committed uh, to assisting uh, folk in this sector. Last year, our government invested some $1.7 billion of dollars on developmental services, an increase of over half a billion since 2003. Wow. Now, it's important to note that 98 per cent of that funding goes directly to services. The answer to the member's question. Uh, our 2013 budget proposes to add $42.5 million additional dollars a year for developmental services, and we estimate that this will help uh, some uh, 1,104 families uh, with various uh, supports. With this new investment, our government, Mr. Speaker, will have invested more Answer. than $620 million more. That's a 63 percent increase since 2003. We got some tough work ahead, but we're committed to getting Thank the you. job done. Supplementary. 
Speaker, thank you very much, and I, I want to thank the, uh, the minister for that response. I know that uh, my constituents and most of the constituents across the province will be uh, very proud of what we've managed to do when it comes to that sector. I will say, though, however, that the $42 million, of course, that you've just mentioned as being included in this year's budget is going to require passing of the budget for that $42 million oh, yeah. to flow. That's I know right. my constituents are very interested and hopeful that both of the opposition parties will find the capacity to first read the budget and second support the budget. So, Speaker, uh, through you to the minister, minister, once again, can you define for me, please, what that $42 million should we get the budget passed will be used for to support yeah. people with developmental disabilities not only in my riding of Thunder Bay Atacoke but right across the province thank you Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker that uh, those uh, investment dollars will support a wide uh, uh, range of supports uh, that are that are needed and like like the member I'm uh, obviously hopeful that the budget will pass uh, we hear a lot of uh, concern about uh, this sector from all, all parties in this House, and we do need to move ahead uh, with this. And uh, doing that through you, Mr. Speaker, from the quickest County way to do that is uh, through uh, the budget. Seat. I just want to emphasize, uh, Mr. Speaker, that this is, uh, this is new money. Uh, it's uh, money that's, uh, that's badly needed. There's much more to be done, of course. And we'll continue to work uh, uh, with uh, Ontario's developmental services sector uh, and families and others to make sure we have a, f a, more, a more fair and sustainable system. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I beg to inform the House that I have uh, uh, today laid upon the table an annual greenhouse gas pro progress, report, progress report from the uh, Environmental Commissioner of Ontario. Member from the PN Carleton on a point of work. Mr. Speaker, I know the time for introductions has passed, but one of my close friends, one of my mentors, and one of our former uh, members of this assembly and cabinet minister, um, Norm Sterling, was here earlier, and I just wanted to acknowledge him. Mr. Uh, Mr. Sterling was recognized in the House, but uh, I appreciate your, your point of order. The member for Consumer Services on the point of order. Speaker, if you indulge me, I'm so happy to have my sister here today, Jill McCharles Crane from Ajax, who's seen me through thick and thin, Speaker. I'm just thrilled to have an important family member here with me today. Thank you. Member from Cambridge on the point of order. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I would uh, like to correct my record in my question today. I implied that the Premier released the documents. I'd like the record to be corrected to say that the PCs and the NDP ordered the documents released and the Liberals should be shamed to comply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, before I do that, uh, I'm going to remind all members that there is an opportunity and it is a point of order to correct a record, but any other editorial is to be vacated from that correction of the record. The member from Kenora Rainy River on order. Um, I just wanted to formally welcome to the legislature uh, Gloria Pronger, who's the executive director of the Mary Berglund Community Health Center, and also um, her board member, Chicky Pozzola. So, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> member from London Fanshawe, point of order. Thank you, Speaker. I would like to formally welcome as well to the Legislature Linda Zimmerman and Richard Lewis from London. They're here today um, visiting the Legislature, and I hope they have a great time. Thank you. We have a deferred vote on Mr. Hillier's amendment to Mr. Wilson's amendment to the motion to apply a time of certain business of the House. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
Would all members take their seats, please? Members take their seats, please. Mr. Hillier has moved that Mr. Wilson's amendment uh, to the motion to apply a timetable to certain businesses of the House be amended by adding the following, that in the event of a prorogation before the want of confidence motion standing in the name of the member from Simcoe Gray is called, the motion shall be placed on the orders and notices paper on the second day of the subsequent session and shall be called on the fifth sessional day of the new session. All those in favour of the amendment will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Arnott. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Sherman. Mr. Sherman. Mrs. Elliott. Mrs. Elliott. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Cleese. Mr. Cleese. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. Willett. Mr. Willett. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fid Sorry, Mr. York. Mr. York. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Mrs. McKenna. Mrs. McKenna. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. Leone. Mr. Leone. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Milligan. Mr. Milligan. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Jackson. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. All those opposed to the amendment will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Malloy. Mr. Malloy. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Garretson. Mr. Garretson. Mrs. Jeffrey. Mrs. Jeffrey. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Crater. Mr. Crater. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Ms. Peruzza. Ms. Peruzza. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Ms. Broughton. Ms. Broughton. Mrs. Cansfield. Mrs. Cansfield. Mr. Balkasin. Mr. Balkasin. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. McNeely. Mr. McNeely. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Nackby. Mr. Nackby. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Darmerla. Ms. Darmerla. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Ms. Jasset. Ms. Jasset. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Genova. Ms. Genova. Mr. Marchese. Mr. Marchese. Madame Jolina. Madame Jolina. Mr. Prue. Mr. Prue. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Sayer. Mr. Sayer. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Shine. Mr. Shine. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. The ayes are 34, the nays are 64. The ayes being 34 and the nays being 64, I declare the motion lost. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.